and welcome to another episode of A Wicked Parlay. I am your host, Justin, and today I have a special guest. My guest is my good friend Mike from the previous uh, couple episodes ago. And uh, you want to say hello, everybody? Hello. Good to be back. Thank you for having me, Justin. Yeah. Great to be back. I understand you got some more questions for me. Sure. Absolutely. And before we get into those crazy questions, mm -hmm. let's hear a great story. Uh, or perhaps a, a legendary story from one of the things that are oddities that happened during your time in the hospital, working for the hospital in the military. Mm -hmm. Ah, so I've had, I've seen some weird and some tragic stories, unfortunately, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, more cases, and stuff like that, some of the tragic ones. I've had some of the weirder ones, uh, like uh, guys coming in drunk. And they have a Coke bottle shoved up the rectum. Is that, that also, that's for real though? Like that actually I believe, happened? yeah, I know. I was not witness to that. I heard, like, uh, that was a story I came into at the start of my shift and someone's, and then the guy I was relieving, he told me, yeah, this is what we had. And I'm like, ah, fun night for y'all. You <laughs> know, good. Oh, you know, he's, and I'm like, was it broken? They're like, thankfully, no. Oh. This is a Coke bottle, not a Coke can, a Coke bottle. Oh, that's... So it was glass, but apparently it was tough enough. <laughs> <laughs> it was tough glass. Uh, so luckily though, uh, at least uh, from what I heard, luckily everything uh, did, you know, panned out well and he, he made a full recovery. But yeah, I've seen also some very tragic stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate, working in the medical field, you know. It's just how it is, especially in the military. You see tragic stuff all the time, whether it be you know so soldiers or you know or civilians. I'm curious. Do civilians come into military hospitals that are on bases? Yes, we are. Uh, the base that I was at, Fort Leonard Wood, um, had plenty of civilians on it. We we had plenty of DoD civilians that we worked alongside with in the hospital, and soldiers are, have civilian family members, you know, children, spouses, and. You know, you, they're on post. They live on post. Some of them live just off post. But yes, we get plenty of them that are that are not just you know members of the installation, but also work at the hospital and visit the hospital for a variety of reasons, just like any general hospital. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's pretty cool to know that there's some things, and so I, we'll we'll get back to that. Mm -hmm. So the last time we left the episode, we were talking about kind of like uh, people in combat areas who are non-combatant like uh, people that mm -hmm. sometimes get into the line of fire and sometimes are killed. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the ethical gray area uh, of that whole thing. Uh, and I was wondering, you know, did you have perhaps any time to reflect on this particular thing and anything to perhaps add? Um, at this point in time, my stance, uh, what I've said in the last episode, is relatively the same. Yes, I would always like to see less collateral damage, whether it be come to damage to buildings or and because even damaging a building, some people say, well, you know, the building. I'm like, well, that's someone's home, mm -hmm. business. You know, some people spend their lives, you know, in you know certain houses. You have you know, some people live, you know, two, three gen generations in a home, and mm -hmm. then that home's gone, raised to the ground. Mm -hmm. So I understand that it's not easy uh, to try and just. Mi make things go the way you want them to and that comes to civilian you know civilian lives whether it be their how lot their own personal lives or their homes mm -hmm. you know which it's not easy it's not easy to we want to save everyone we want to protect everyone and unfortunately we you know innocent lives are lost it's just an unfortunate reality mm -hmm. of the world we live in um i do hold the position that i would like to see more engagements in less urbanized areas, less populated areas, give the people time to evacuate. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, that luxury is not always at, at, a, at hand. Yeah, I know that in the last time you were discussing the fact that sometimes the people who have caused the conflicts in the urban areas are responsible for the deaths and casualties that happen in those urban environments. And I was upon reflecting on that particular thing a little bit. I was thinking about it, and I wonder, during, there are instances where an enemy is you know perhaps retreating mm -hmm. and they're not choosing to retreat to just the village because they're like trying to put people in danger they're retreating because it's the only option they have mm -hmm. is it, are they still do you think that they're still uh, responsible in that sense well it depends on uh, who they are 
you know, at least in my, I would need more context to, to just be able to just give a definitive answer one is, way or the other. Is there, like, would you say there's a difference then between someone who basically is an insurgent slash terrorist fighting force or, or compared to a full standing army that was, that's, you know, in control by actual power like another nation? Yeah, there's probably, a, a, I would probably draw a difference. Um, I'm not too uh, savvy when it comes to like all of, you know, like all of wartime, you know, codes and operations, stuff like that. I'm not, I was never in a, in a combat zone and I'm not really fully, you know, I've not, I've not really kept up to date on all of the rules and regulations, you know, because mm -hmm. I didn't really think, I never really figured that I would be the type to go overseas and fight in war in a foreign, na a foreign land. But my general uh, principle, based on just my personal code, is I don't, I'm not a fan of fighting in populated area, populated, heavily densely populated areas. I don't like that. I don't. I want. And if the fight is going to be there, I feel like both sides should have some type of moral code or obligation to evacuate the citizens, get them out, get them to safety, and then if you if you have to fight. In a in an urbanized uh, city environment, then yes, you can. But try and save both sides. I feel should be obligated to save as many civilian lives as possible. This is not their fight. They don't want this fight. Mm -hmm. They don't. They didn't sign up for this. The people on both sides who are wielding weapons, they're the ones who are ready to fight and ready to die, but not the civilians. When it comes to let's say some media, for mm -hmm. instance, um, last time we talked about a couple of movies. Um, I want to talk about a little bit about some of the video games that come out. There's a particular franchise that you probably are familiar with, the, the Call of Duty franchise. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Call of Duty franchise often features war zone areas that take place in the Middle East and in other areas that often would be would likely be populated by civilians. Uh, do you think that games that portray those kinds of scenes and I would say to some extent advocate those kinds of uh, actions create a sense of de- uh, stigmatization or dehumanizing elements to a person's you know psyche who might engage in warfare in those areas possibly especially since it's uh, there there's probably this uh, mentality that a lot of us have a little comfort zone where is be like you know this is my home like if if my home if our if my neighborhood became a war zone like a physical war zone I would probably be emotionally devastated uh, at what would ha about the potential threat of it happening and I would just simply even if I got like me my family my pets like all my everything even if I managed to evacuate safely and no one I know or personally am attached to was killed mm -hmm. the fact that I come home to what's left of my home and probably be less maybe nothing you know is um, that would be emotionally devastating so I understand that when you see this stuff in video games happening overseas you know, um, yes, it might create a, or it might uh, maybe maybe normalization, uh, or you know, like you said, destigmatization. Normalize, it, dehumanize. Yeah, like where it might like, yeah, it might kind of like, it might it, people might become a little less sensitive to it. I could see that that possibility might ha happen, but it's not. But I don't look at Call of Duty video games as anything realistic in terms of like them trying to actually legitimately tra psychologically ready you for actual combat. Sure, it's like an action movie, like, you know, yeah. something like that. Yeah, there's... Like Rambo the, or something. Yeah, there's, there's a, the, like, the, was it the Hollywood is a... There's, like, a Hollywood, you know, kind of stylization sure. where you, it's over-glorified, it's over-dramatized, it's not grounded in reality. Um, so, and I don't look to video games for anything grounded in actual realism, mm -hmm. you know. I do wonder about this other concept that I've heard of before, um, the idea of the honorable battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, I'd heard this from a particular uh, individual on a podcast, and uh, the context doesn't particularly matter all that much outside of just understanding what the general concept of it means. And I think it kind of is the idea that there can be battlefields that can build be have a deeper meaning and bring glory to yourself and perhaps your your, your country. and. Is that an idea that you've ever saw, observed, in anybody that you encountered while on base? That would so uh, elaborate that question a little bit better. I'm sure, like, I'm, sure. I'm a little confused as to what you mean by a battlefield. Okay, you know? so like, you know, I, I gave you an example, like a character from Hollywood. Like, so in Forrest Gump, there's like uh, the there's what's his name, Lieutenant Dan, uh, from Forrest Gump. 
essentially was like this gung-ho, like I'm going to die because my family fought and died in every single conflict. That kind of idea. Mm -hmm. And in that character's portrayal, at least, it was supposed to be honorable to die in, that ser in service of the country. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, did you ever run into anybody who had that particular ideology or, or even something that resembled that? No, I mean, nowadays, if I were to look at that, I would, without trying to be crude, I would consider that someone who essentially has a death wish. I would not label that as, like, I've never met someone who, from my perspective, appeared eager to die. Most people, I, I, they would say, like, dying in battle is an honorable death, but you don't want to die, mm -hmm. you know, in battle. You want, to, you want to survive and make it back. Now, those people who do want to die, I would say, like, are probably going through a very rough mental state, mm -hmm. you know, and they probably need help. Sure. I would not look at some. I would not look at that as a normal aspect of the military. Throughout my time, the six years I was in, I didn't encounter anyone who was willing or eager to die. In a medical environment, I encounter old people who are sometimes kind of like they feel like they're at the end of their life, and they're saying, "Oh, just pull the plug on me" and stuff like that. To which I, you know, I feel they, sad for them. Do you think they really mean that, or are they just saying that? Out of I frustration? think it's a it's a fifty fifty. Like somehow, they're like they're kind of partly serious, but at the same time, they don't want to. Mm -hmm. But they feel like they're at their they're at the end of the rope anyway. So they feel like you know death is right around the corner. You know, as we get older, we know that you know. I mean, every day death creeps closer to every person on you know one day at a time. It's a little it's, dark. It's, <laughs> it's a little dark. It's, it's, but that's life. That's reality. It's That's true. just how it is. Every day you're alive, you get one day closer to not being alive, for whatever reason. And that's, uh, I don't, I, death is unavoidable. I don't embrace it, I don't want to die. I'm going to do what I can to stay alive as long as I can and enjoy my life as but much as I can. But you accept the reality. But I accept the grim reality that is death. Does it have to be grim, though? Well, I don't consider death to be uh, happy. I don't consider, I mean, you can die with honor, you can die with a sense of fulfillment, but at the end, at the end of it all, I mean, the leg, the mo you know, you can, I mean, death in terms of like how you die can be grim, but I feel like, you know, life is about, life is a story. There are many chapters to it, and at the end of your, at the end of your story, Look, I, I try. I want to be able to look back on my life, on my story, and did I tell a good story? Did I tell a story that's worth being told to others? And I will look at. And some people think that dying on the battlefield adds to that story. I'm like, I understand serving our country, dying on the field of battle, but I don't want people to feel like they should die in battle. I want people to fight to win, not fight to die. Okay. When it comes to other things. Mm -hmm. Let's just let's move on a little bit. Well, there's there's another thing I was kind of curious about that, somewhat controversial in some groups, and that is, is the whole idea behind uh, if you're not if you're not a heteronormative individual, say you're, mm -hmm. you're homosexual or something other than right. uh, in the military. Did you ever see anyone like that 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 was first of all in that particular camp, and then second of all discriminated against because of that? Yes, one of my sergeants was trans. Mm -hmm. A male, a trans woman, a man who had transitioned into a woman, mm -hmm. and um, I got to know her very well. I had no problems with her. I and didn't, and she did what she could to not um, really like put that out there. She just mostly understood that this is her personal life. This is her personal way of life. She didn't let it get in the way of her military duty and responsibility. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm like. I mean that's that's all you can ask for, you know. Duty, duty, you know, business before pleasure. Duty and res duty sure. and responsibility come first when serving in the military. So, so, in terms of that, you know, excellent. You know, in terms of discrimination, I was not aware of any. Um, not that not that I know of. My unit was pretty open and inviting. I don't think I don't I was not so. If there was discrimination, I was not aware of it. Okay, well that's that's good to know. Because, I mean, you hear some pretty dark stories sometimes, and it's like, if that, that's really what's going on, you know, that would be kind of a grim reality, not to too, put too much grim in this. <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate, yeah. I would like to see, there's a little discrimination against all colors and creeds as possible, but unfortunately, that's, you know, society is a constant work in progress. Yeah.
That is true. So, yeah, you spoke before about, like, you had a particular person who lived off of Watt Avenue who ah, you know, went yes. there. And uh, you spoke about how there was a person who came from China to get mm -hmm. citizenship by joining the military. Um, I was wondering, you know, how often did you get to interact with the various people that you were, you know, stationed with? Was it, like, a pretty regular thing, like a workplace? Was it, like, a dorm room? Like, what was the kind of experience? Well, let's see. In basic, it was where I encountered the... The, the guy who went from who came from China mm -hmm. um, after basic we parted ways never saw him again so I never got to interact with him okay um, when it came to the guy my friend who lived off Watt Avenue mm -hmm. he and I were we met up at duty station at Fort Leonard Wood and we were he was my first roommate um, when we introduced each other when we were introduced ourselves to each other we got to know each other better we found out he's like where are you from and I'm like I'm from Sacramento he's like where at and I'm like Lincoln, and he's like, Lincoln, 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 and I'm like, uh, just north of Rockland and Roseville, and he's like, oh, yeah, and he's like, and I'm, I'm like, well, you sound like you're from that area, he's like, yeah, I lived off Watt Avenue, and I'm like, no shit. <laughs> you said uh, this, it sounds like him, so there was a lot of accents? Um, well, he was Filipino, so I really don't, I hadn't interacted with a whole lot of Filipinos in terms of, like, understanding, like, you know, they have this accent, this accent, so on and so forth. Sure. You know, I had interacted, before I joined the military, I went to American River College, mm -hmm. and I had met some Filipino people there. Um, you know, all great people. Loved, I loved interacting with them. They were really nice, really fun. Mm -hmm. um, so he was, so my friend in the military, uh, he was, uh, he was a uh, uh, same rank as me. He eventually made sergeant before me, so... The rules of uh, interacting with people are different depending upon rank. If you have a non-commissioned officer like a sergeant, they're technically not supposed to directly interact routinely with uh, privates and specialists. They, they, you know, the army is kind of like, hey, we put a line here, kind of distance yourself. You know, it, and the reason is just to keep order. It's it, it's a hierarchy of like you know like the your these are superiors, these are subordinates. Mm -hmm. Don't. You know, try not to try to avoid me. They understand. Hey, you're all single soldiers. I mean, he's my roommate. Yeah. Of course, we're gonna interact. Sure. But like in terms of like going out and like go, leaving post together and going drinking at a bar, you know, kind of try to avoid that stuff like that. You know, okay. that type of you know extracurricular mingling. You know, that kind of stuff is like you know a little discouraged. You know, and I mentioned last time about how there was like uh, a trainee, yes. like permanent party versus trainees. Not, you know, stay yes. away from it. <laughs> yes. yes, I remember this. Yeah. So, when it comes to the various things that uh, you interact, like your daily activities, so our army separates you based upon whether or not you're a sergeant or certain rankings and things like that. But like, if you're going to like work in the hospital, for instance, mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're going to be coming in contact with all walks of people. Absolutely. And so, because of that particular thing, I'm assuming that you may have to interact and get to know certain people who are higher ranked than you? Oh, yes. If it's for the sake of uh, your daily duties, then yes. Interaction, understanding, you know, this person, what they're doing, what they're, what they're good at, you know, that's just, that's just, you know, essentially work, mm -hmm. you know. It's just when you're off duty, when you're not actively working, when you're not doing your active MOS duties, mm -hmm. and you're like at home, Mm -hmm. relaxing that's when the the division is kind of like you know set and like I said it's not perfectly rigid they allow some like intermingling and stuff like that they just don't want it to be constant fraternization all the time mm -hmm. but yeah when it comes to like I interacted with officers first sergeant sergeant major I interacted with a bunch of people directly and indirectly over the phone, in person, went to visit them in their offices. You, told, you said that there was the head general of the base you had to do an x-ray on or something like that? Yeah, well, yeah, there was a general and an installation I did his x-ray on. And okay. afterwards, he got to know me personally. You know, not, not personally as in we became friends. He just, he would, whenever he saw me from that point on, he instantly recognized me. He instantly knew who I was. Interesting. That's that must have been kind of intimidating. <laughs> Not really, because he was actually really nice. He was uh he was really 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 chill. You know, he was a two star general, but he was like really chill. There was a there is an awkward story though, because oh, okay, here we go. Is a, is a, <laughs> he's a general, so he's literally anywhere he goes, 
you know, like senior leadership of that re of that area would meet up with him and, you know, like escort him around and talk to him. And, you know, it's essentially like, you know, the big wigs, you know, so the big wigs of our hospital, my colonel, my lieutenant colonel, my first sergeant and my sergeant major, they would meet with uh, our general, our post commander, and when he's visiting the hospital, you know, on some like official business or whatever, they would they would they they would kind of like escort him around, show him around, and just answer any questions he got. So one time, um, he they were leaving the emergency department. Mm -hmm. They were going through the double doors into the hallway. That's the same hallway that is connecting to the radiology department. I was leaving the radiology department with a portable X-ray machine going about to go into the ER to do a portable chest X-ray. Mm -hmm. And so I was going to pass by them. Mm -hmm. So they're leaving one way, I'm leaving the other way, and we're going to meet and pass on each other in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And through customs and courtesies, someone of that high rank, you greet and acknowledge unless they're in the middle of a conversation. If they're busy with something, don't interrupt them to you know greet them. Just stay out of the way and move on. Mm -hmm. As I'm passing him, this is after he's already I've already done his extra. So he already knows who I am. Mm -hmm. As I'm passing him, and I'm not joking, he looks at me, sees who I am, sticks out, and tries to do a fist bump with me as I'm passing by. Uh -huh. And I kind of like slowly like I'm like and I'm like, well, I'll and I'm like, I I know better than to to than to not respond to a two-star general <laughs> who's personally <laughs> acknowledging me in front of my commanders and my <laughs> my high-ranking superiors. Sure. So I fist bump him back and he's and he like saying, you know, have a good day and stuff like that and I'm like, yes sir. So I'm like, that was awkward. <laughs> but it was, it was cool and I went and after I shot the x-ray I went back to my section and they're like, and I told the story and they're like, that didn't happen. I'm like, it did. It blew my mind too. I wasn't expecting a two-star general to offer a fist bump to me, but he did. <laughs> and, you know, but that goes to show that, like, in the military, we're all human at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this goes back to what we had in the first issue, first episode of, like, you know, like, do they try and, like, brainwash you into becoming, like, cold-blooded? It's like, no. No. The army that I know of, that I've experienced, we're all people. We all have emotions. We're all more than willing to, like, demonstrate our individual uniqueness, character, personality traits, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. As long as you adhere to proper customs and courtesies, you end the sentence with like sir, ma'am, sergeant, first sergeant, you know. As long as you as long as you pay attention to the proper procedures and protocols and you fulfill your duties, you know, respectably and responsibly, mm -hmm. you know, you're pretty much free to have as much personality as you want. Okay. You know, and people know about it. People knew that I played video games. You know, some of my uh, some of my sergeants kind of gave me a hard time over it. They're like You've been playing Pokemon lately, and I'm just like, <laughs> and I'm like, I haven't played Pokemon in over ten years, Sergeant. So, <laughs> I don't mind the army in terms of like its personalities. You know, everyone come, from all walks of life come together. Sure. And we all have roughly a similar mission, but outside of that core mission, you know, you fan out and you get everyone. Okay. You get so many different people from different backgrounds, diverse personalities, values, ethics, political opinions. Mm -hmm. Well, well, let's jump to that political thing in a second, but there's another thing I wanted to ask you about before we get into that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, the thing I want to know was, was that before you mentioned about the Yuba, I believe, training grounds or proving grounds? Ah, uh, the Yuma proving grounds, yes. Proving grounds. Is it Yuma? Yuma. Yuma, okay. Yeah, as opposed to Yuba College. Yeah, okay, yes. gotcha, okay. Um, and so, what exactly is that place and what do they do? Well, the Yuma proving grounds was a special forces uh, facility from what I understand. It was kind of, uh, I was there for only one month. I was there literally because the sergeant who was there, who did x-ray, because they literally had one x-ray guy there. It was that small of a place. Okay. The Yuma Proving Grounds is Special Forces. The sergeant who was there apparently went from what's called green to gold. He went from a, from a non-commissioned to a commissioned officer. He essentially went from a sergeant to like a lieutenant. And, you know, that little, that lateral, instead of going, instead of officers going this way and this way, he went part way up and then jumped over to officer rank, which is totally, which is a totally real thing. It happens. It doesn't happen all that often. Most people, like, when they start, they stay within that same, you know, air, the same rank structure. But every now and then you'll get sergeants who jump to officer, you know, and... That's what the that's what the previous X-ray guy there did. So there is there a benefit to doing that? Well, better pay, 
okay. much better pay, financial stability, and uh, you know, so and uh, I believe you know, and also in terms of authority, a lieutenant, uh, you know, like officers outrank non-commissioned officers generally, mm -hmm. you know. Um, does that calls? come? Does that come with like a particular like? Uh, do you have to like say I'm going to serve for X number of years in order to do that, or like what's the process look like? It depends. That? It's based on roles and responsibility, and also education. I could have become an officer. I just chose not to because I didn't really care for that. You know, if I wanted to go an officer in the field of radiology, I would not be a radiology tech. I would have been a radiologist. I would have been the doctor who reads the X-rays. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're doing the now when you're an officer. You're paid a lot more, but you're also in a position of authority and responsibility, meaning, you know, you're in charge of a division or a district or a section, but you're not, you know, sometimes you don't interact with them constantly, whereas sergeants and soldiers, they're constantly interacting every day, every day, whereas the officer is above the non-commissioned officers, and the officer is like saying, hey, I want this to happen, and the sergeants are like, okay, this is what our commander wants. Mm -hmm. And then the sergeants turn to the soldiers and go, this is what this is what he wants, he or she wants, this is how we're going to get it done. So the officers sometimes interact with the lower rank people, but not all the time. Not nearly as much as sergeants. Mm -hmm. And the benefits are like, you know, better pay and, you know, additional authority and responsibility. And I would assume that the only negatives are just the extra authority? Definitely responsibility. Um, you know, it can be harder and it a lot longer to like uh, essentially get to where you. And there's fewer officers, meaning it's not as easy to like rank up. You can easily go, you know, rise through the ranks of like the enlisted. But for commissioned officers, it can be a little tougher at times to essentially bump up in rank and 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 progress throughout your career. It can be it can be a little challenging in different ways. So maybe that's why some people like to start off with the uncommissioned and then go to commissioned once they get to a high enough rank for it to be worth it? Or if they just like didn't know about it, they didn't know that these options were available. You know, some people change, you know, some people get a few years into a regular career, you know, out here in the civilian life and then they jump ship when they realize there's a better option or a better opportunity. It's just different, you know, different people have different reasons for doing their different things. Makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's let's jump into the political landscape a little bit of the military, at least from what you saw. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm roughly going to say this, and this is probably going to sound terrible, but is it fair to say that most are conservative in the military, at least where you were at? From what I understood, yes, most were conservative. Was yeah. there a reason for that? Um, in terms of, like, the mentality of it, I don't understand. Um, I mean, based on what I, I'm in a comment and this is just my political opinion right my, my personal opinion about like politics I've seen that um, uh, most people who support the military in general are tend to be either centrist or conservative leaning mm -hmm. um, there are plenty not not to denigrate anyone on the left who supports the military I'm not trying to do that I'm not saying you know you don't, don't sure. support the military or you know I'm just saying that I've seen that a lot of people who support like first responders police firemen and paramedics and the military, they tend to be conservative in terms of their overall political views, at least here in America, from what I've seen. There could be data that conflicts that or further explains why that is. In terms of, I've never asked anyone, I was always discouraged, when it comes to your workplace, don't talk politics. So politics, religion, kind of don't talk about? Don't really talk thinking? about all that much, you know, you know, try to avoid that. You don't know what their opinion is, their motivations for joining. With their motivations for voting, the way they vote, mm -hmm. how they came to hold these views and opinions, their backstory, their history, their personal experiences. Um, with personal friends, you know, like you can probably, like in, when you've reached a certain comfort level, you could probably ask that. But in general, I didn't know enough people well enough to really try and be like, hey, what's your political opinion and why and stuff like that. I just, I know better because I feel like politics can be very divisive. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that experience. I didn't want to feel like I was part of any sense of divisiveness. I just want to coexist, get along, and if we happen to disagree, we just agree to disagree, and that's just it. Okay, that's interesting. I just was curious, just because like there's a uh, you know a large portion of people who are civilians that seem to take militaristic, um, we'll say approaches to certain things and certain things that they wear and things like that, and they tout like certain like flags. Or like stickers on their vehicles and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if you ever saw anything like that while you're in the military. Well, I I've been 
in the military, you know, it's kind of redundant to see a car that says, you know, my spouse serves or stuff like that. Sure. It's like, well, gee, I, I'm, I'm shocked. You know, we're on a military installation. I bet you either you or someone you know is, serves. Sure. You know, but for the most part, um, yeah, from what I've seen, you know, at my base, there were people that were conservative. They, um, uh, some of them were religious. Like, uh, you know, you would occasionally see them on social media posting on, like, Facebook and stuff like that. Like, uh, you know, religious stuff. You know, I generally... I'm not, you know, I'm not a religious person in general, mm -hmm. but I don't, but people, I, I let people believe what they want to believe in sure. terms of like religion and whatever faith they have, you know, whatever belief structure, belief system they want to believe in. You know, I'm, more, I'm very easygoing. Most of my, I mean, my life, you know, I live my life by the simple of you live your life. I live my life. We each live according <laughs> to our own benefits. As long as neither of us are actively doing something to hurt someone. We can just, you know, we can get along, and if we disagree on some things, we just leave each other alone. Yeah, makes that makes a lot of sense. It's like a way to have a peaceful existence and mm -hmm. not, you know, stir the pot as it were. Right. Um, I would like to know a couple of things though. When it comes to certain things like video games and things like that, you're playing obviously in your barracks and things like that, right? Right. Or yeah. I played I played Call of Duty, and like, <laughs> you know, Destiny, Apex Legends. Well, I didn't play Apex Legends until after the military, but yeah, I've played a lot of shooters. Okay. A lot of first-person shooters that you know, I played a, I played a lot of video games that require that use the concept of violence or killing as the main mechanic to do something in a video game. Yes. Well, my main question was not necessarily about the games, but more like the hardware and stuff that you were allowed. Like, for instance, how how's the internet connection on a military base? Depends on the provider, depend which depends on the re where you're located. Um, I had at most, like my my starting plan was only like 10, 10 gigs per second, I think, or something like that. That was it. it How could you play Destiny on ten gigs? <laughs> it wasn't easy. Ten gigs a second was not easy. I eventually upgraded to fifty, mm -hmm. um, but like sometimes, and the fees were like a hundred a month for like fifty Whoa. gigs. That was it. That's crazy. It was. We were in the Midwest. Uh, Fort Leonard Wood is in the Ozarks. Okay. So, like I said, it depends on the region, depends on the available providers in terms of internet speed, connection, and you know strength stuff like that. Now, when it came to actual equipment, my personal barracks, I was allowed pretty much whatever I want. Uh, I had at one point, I had a, I mean, I still do, I still have it, a 60-inch TV. <laughs> in my your, place, yeah, a computer, in my my yeah, in my barracks. You know, it's my it's my barracks. Like they say, like pretty much, do your job, fulfill your duties and responsibilities. Do and then, what, as long as you're not doing anything, as not as long as you're not breaking the rules, do whatever you want at home. So, what kind of rules were in place for your home life? Maintain the cleanliness of the barracks. Okay. Um. Obviously, like don't break the law when it comes to like you know like drugs or like sexual assault stuff like that. Sure. Um. Could you it, bring women back to your barracks? People did it all the time. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. but like I said, you know, trainees, definitely off limits. I uh, can't <laughs> do that. Not even supposed to, like, invite them over to your barracks. So a permanent party soldier like me, I couldn't even invite them over to, like, have drinks with them. Couldn't even do that. Because they, they, like, they didn't want anything happening. They didn't want to risk anything happening, even if it were just two guys or two girls that had no attraction to, one, to each other. Just did not want it. Mm. Like, literally, like... No, they're like, here's that line, thou shalt not cross. Interesting. And this is the example of if you were to break over that line, uh, then I, you could get... Here's the thing. I technically did once out of a necessity to care for a soldier without doing anything. It was a female soldier who was locked out of her barracks. Now, I lived in a four-section barracks store where it's like me and my roommate up here, another roommate up here, two people down here, two people down here. Mm -hmm. I lived up here in, a to in the top right, essentially, and she lived down here in the bottom left. Two female soldiers lived together. She was notoriously known as a trainee for locking herself out of the barracks. This how, had happened... How do you lock yourself out of your own barracks? What right? happens is at the barracks, we had a key card system. We didn't have keys. So the door auto-locks every time you close it. Yeah. So you have to have a key card to insert. 
Sometimes she would leave the key card not in her wallet and leave the wallet in the room, or sometimes the key card would not be in her wallet when she left. So multiple times she locked herself out. One time she locked herself out after we had, uh, what's it called, uh, I forget, it's some type of an annual event. It was some type of annual event where we all get up in our dress uniforms and you're invited to come sit down here, watch some entertainment. It was like a yearly thing we did on the installation for our hospital where we acknowledge this is what we've done good, this is where we need to improve, here's some awards for people who have dem demonstrated you know, something out out outstanding in mm -hmm. terms of like their respective fields and stuff like that. Did you ever win any other awards? I never won an award. I. I mean, I was, I was an average soldier. I never went above and beyond the call okay. of duty. I went, uh, I, went to this, I went to this event. On my way back, I made it back to my barracks safe and sound because they allowed you to drink, but I was like, I'll just have one glass of, like, you know, cheap wine mm -hmm. and then just call it a night. And they're like, you want to buy a bottle? I'm like, sure, I'll buy a bottle, go home, put it in the fridge, get it nice and chill, and I'll enjoy it leisurely over the next couple weeks. You know, I was a light, I was a light casual drinker. I got a knock on my door after I got home. Um, the trainee, she was there. She was, if I remember correctly, she was uh, Korean, spoke well, spoke good English, but not the most, um, not the best in terms of like customs and cultures. It was raining outside. Mm -hmm. She needed a place to stay, and I'm like, well, it's cold. It's the Midwest. It's raining outside. And it's not one of those hot, you know, rains of the Midwest. It was cold. So mm -hmm. like, come on in, sit down there. You know, I'm just gonna sit over here and play video games. She eventually, like, laid down on my bed and fell asleep. And I'm just like, you're lucky I'm a nice guy who would not take advantage of you because I'm just like, Jesus, this is like. If my sergeants walked in and saw this, they would look at me and they would be like, my office right fucking now. Really? Absolutely. But I but I sent her away. I like as soon as, but I I messaged her roommate and I'm like whenever you get back come knock on my door and tell me and come pick her up. And she's like, "Okay, no problem." So she knocked, came picked her up. You know, nothing happened. I man, I, I was <laughs> I, I the knew, bullet there. <laughs> I knew better than to try something. Not be, for two reasons. One, against the rules, and secondly, I wasn't at all interested in her. Hmm. Like at all. So Dodged, dodged a bullet. I even, like, I told that story later to a couple of my sergeants, like, a week later. And they're like, wait, what? And I'm just like, <laughs> relax, relax. And I explained it to them. They're like, well. And they went they went and talked to her. And they're like, okay, yeah, she 100% corroborates the story. And I'm like, yeah, she fucking better. <laughs> you know, better not get any false accusations. Because false accusations can ruin people's careers. Also, when it comes to a false accusation, even if it's, let's say, like, they can't prove it 100%, does the accusation itself enough to de derail someone's career? It can, it, can, it can screw up someone's career. People have had to leave, like, a guy who was accused, never convicted, mm -hmm. so therefore can't be said he's guilty, mm -hmm. still moved entire installations, like, literally sent to an entirely different installation because of the stigma that has now been attached to that person's identity oh, no. on the installation. And, no. even, and even if it wasn't true, that still, that kind of thing happens. That it can, like, fall, like accusations are a heavy thing. A lot, you know. You, that's why I, I, I'm always of the camp of, if you have an opinion, fine. If you're going to make an accusation that can be very damning, mm -hmm. you need to prove it. If you can't prove it, you know, I said like with this, like take for instance the election, the political, the election, the last election. How some people say that. Trump won and Biden cheated and stuff like that. I'm like, can you prove it? And they're like, do you have proof beyond reasonable doubt that can hold up in court? If not, keep that to yourself. Because mm -hmm. I'm not of the camp, and this is someone who voted for Trump. Oh, okay. I supported Trump. I wanted him to win. He didn't win. Oh, well. I'm not, personally, I'm not that, like I said, I'm not even politically invested to the point where I, like, lose sleep over this or I feel like, oh, my God, the country is coming to an end because I didn't win the political, I didn't win the political battle and stuff like that. I'm like, I don't care. But I just, I care. But if you have an opinion that can, uh, that can be damning, don't be throwing out, don't be slandering or defaming people. Don't be throwing out accusations that can hurt people if you don't have... If you don't have proof to back it up, because at that point it's gossip, it's a rumor. Mm -hmm. 
and gossip and rumors alone. I, I hate that shit in the workplace. I hate it. Whether it's military, hospital, we had people doing it. Pissed me the fuck off whenever I could see it going on, and I tried to stop it. I tried to do what I could to stop the gossip. You know, I, I didn't like it. Like, do you think that people gossip more on bases because there's less to do? It depends on the motivations of the people. Sometimes, I might be a little controversial to say this, but it was, there were women in, on a, on, in my hospital were the ones that, from my, from my experience, they were the ones that really liked to gossip. I, am, I saw, I, I encountered a situation where uh, a soldier fret, got to the station from what I heard, this is how it went. Normally when you show up, you're supposed to show up in your uniform. He showed up in civilian clothes. You're like, and people were like, that's not, that's not right. You know, you should be dressed in uniform when you're showing up saying, hey, I'm reporting for duty. Sure. He showed up in civilian clothes. So because of that, the civilians, like, you know, one of the civilians was like spreading gossip about how like he's like unfit and like not a good soldier. Mm -hmm. And I'm like... She's telling this to other civilians and other soldiers in the section who have not met this new guy yet. So they're tainting the way in which he's... Exactly. Him. Like, it's literally... It's like, uh, I guess, poisoning the well in a sense. It's like yeah. po it's poisoning the well for their opinion of him without them even met, meeting him. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is one instance that you saw or happened upon. That doesn't define his entire character, and it's not fair to just run his name through the mud like that, to drag him through the mud based on one incident that's not even all that damning. It's not like he showed up drunk and got into a fight. Mm -hmm. He showed up in he showed up dressed in normal clothes. Was it a one-time deal or is this like a regular thing? For what? Him showing up in regular clothes? Yeah. The one-time deal. So, an, one time for who knows whatever possible reason was enough for this this woman to spread a rumor about him being unfit. About him, like, just, like, not being a good soldier, yeah. Like, you know, and I did not, I, I heard about that, that that she was saying this. I almost went to her straight to her face and just was about to tell her to shut the fuck up. And why didn't you? Because I'm not, the, because I know, I, I'm not the type of person to want to make waves. You're upset, so I you're went, upset enough to, to feel that strongly, but not enough to act So I it. went to her boss. I went to, a, uh -huh. I went to... Because they're in in the, my department, we have a civilian boss and a military boss, like who runs the radiology department. I went to the civilian boss, who I'm good friends with. I know her; she knows me. We interact with each other. We love you know we love hanging out with each other. We're friends on Facebook, even still to this day. Mm -hmm. I went to her and I explained the situation, and she's like, "Gotcha. I see where you're coming from, and I see why you're angry." And I'm like, "Yeah, I I feel like this needs to stop." Like, it's not, I, I know that she, she wouldn't like it if I did this to her, so I don't think it's fair for her to do it to someone else, especially someone she does not know well. Mm -hmm. So That's good. They were able to stop that. Yeah, yeah. I could tell that her mood or opinion of me wasn't too fond from that point on, but I'm like, I don't give a shit. Yeah, you're going to be... Really I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defend anyone who I feel like is being unfairly treated. Mm -hmm. I mean, who knows? I mean, like, if you hadn't done, if you hadn't done something like that, perhaps maybe one day she would have turned to you, and you would have been the, the person that she was making rumors about. I have no doubt that that probably happened. Like I said, there are some people that are just gossipy in, in nature. They just love to chatter, you know. And I'm not gonna say like she's a evil, terrible person or anything like that. I'm like, this is just one trait about her personality that I just did not care for because I think it contributed to something negative. But I don't think it was malicious in terms of like her wanting to be evil or bad faith or you know a nasty person. I just think some people like gossip and some people don't care what the gossip is or what effects it may have. Mm -hmm. Okay, well let's let's move on a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so one of the main things that I think at least I'm curious about when it comes to the military is the interactions that the various people have in the military with other military, you know powers like so like the air, the air force the navy uh, the di army uh, uh, different branches Corps. interacting with each other exactly. okay it, what's the structure that happens like when it comes to ranks does do ranks still play a ranks, role ranks still play a role um depending upon now there are some like heads budding in terms of like for instance in the milit in the army when you encounter a sergeant a staff sergeant or a sergeant first class mm -hmm. 
you generally just call them sergeant. You don't have to say the full rank. Okay. Now, I did this one time for uh, the uh, for a Marine. Mm -hmm. He was a staff sergeant in the Marines. I just called him sergeant. He's like, it's staff sergeant. And I looked at him, and I was just like, I was like, understood, Staff Sergeant. He outranks, he out, his authority is much higher than mine because mm -hmm. I was a specialist, and I'm like, yeah, so I just said, yes, Staff Sergeant. So some people, like, get a little bit of an ego trip. Some people are like, like, you know, like, but when it, you know, so rank still applies, like, tech sergeants in the Air Force, you know, so, you know, then there's, uh, I can't remember, the Navy has, like, is kind of weird, whereas, like, Sergeants are still sergeants. They just have slightly different names, like tech sergeant, or you know. And then there's master sergeant. But the Air Force, Army, and Marines are really similar in terms of like the, how they're enlisted or structured. The Navy, I believe, does like petty officers and stuff like that. And I'm just like, and I'm like, I and I'm, for the love of me, I never could mentally memorize that. We didn't interact with many uh, Navy people. Mm -hmm. uh, it was mostly like 80% Army on the base, with some Air Force, Navy, and Marines mixed in occasionally. Okay. And so, like, the interactions were more or less the same, though, right? Like, you basically had the same kind of, like, uh, responsibilities and actions that correspond to their various ranks of the people? Um, in terms of, like, just interacting with them, yes. In terms of authority, ordering me to do stuff, they couldn't do that. Okay. They cannot, like, a, if a master sergeant, if a, if a petty officer or a tech sergeant in the Air Force wanted me to do something, they didn't have the authority to order me to do something. They could try and maybe, if they didn't like my behavior, or if they said they couldn't punish me, they couldn't do issue any type of corrective action of any kind. The most they could do is just make a complaint to like my superiors. They would just be like, you know, they would try and find out. They would look at the patch, try and figure out. Okay, you're from Medac. You're at the hospital. I'm gonna lodge a complaint to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I'm assuming the stuff like that was very rare. Very rare. You know, most interactions were basically cur basic courteous. You know, you'd walk by people and you know, you just like nod your head, and greet stuff like that. You know, and say excuse me, stuff like that when walking past one another. Most of the uh, interactions were very mundane. You know, nothing, se nothing serious. What what group would you say that you interacted with the most? Like, what was the most? The common? Marines. Marines. Okay. Marines. You know why that is, or is it just because there's? It's just. I mean. We had, oh God, what was the name of that place? Um, we had, they had the main hospital, but off on on a, the other side of the installation was a small clinic that also had an x-ray department for trainees. So most trainees did not actually go to the hospital. Most like boot camp recruits mm -hmm. did not go to the hospital if they needed something. They went to a small clinic that was dedicated for soldiers in boot camp, whether it be Air Force, Army, Marines, if you were a tr if you were a boot camp recruit, you went to the clinic unless you had something very serious to go to the go to the main brand, main hospital for. Mm -hmm. So you would interact with, uh, mo like I said, mostly army people there, but occasionally you would get marines, and marines usually would come in as their own little special like bus, and they would get bussed in. The sergeant would this would walk them in, be like, okay, sit down right there. He would check them in. I would take their ID cards and I would just be like, okay, this person has this order, this person has this order, blah, 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 blah. Okay, we'll get to them as soon as possible. It's like, what time are they done? And I'd be like, um, the, ho the the clinic closes at like four. So, you know, sh you know, in terms of when they'll be done, um, you could check back in an hour and they might be done. I don't know. Depends on how busy we are. Set up, seems set up. like it would be quite hectic, what you're, what you're describing. It's like all over the place, it looks, seems like. Well, the clinic was actually very hectic almost every day. You know, there was, you know, you could do a lot of x-rays and depending upon, you know, sometimes you were in the clinic completely by yourself or you had one other person. Sometimes they put like one or two military and then one civilian. Would that overwhelm you almost? Not entirely. Most people, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that I look at a large workload and I just sigh and be like, uh, all right, well, let's get to it. Uh, it's not, that list ain't gonna, uh, you know, clean itself out. I gotta, I gotta get rid of all these, you know, people. You know, occasionally you get the serious injuries, like this one guy had the front of his tibia fractured in multiple pieces. Ouch. Yeah, he was a Marine, actually. He, um, he actually... He said, I asked what happened, because, um, you know, when you, you don't just shoot an x-ray, you try and ask them, hey, okay, we're going to do this leg x-ray on you. What happened? What's going on? He's like, yeah, I jumped off a rock, 
and I jumped off kind of like a boulder and as I landed my foot got between two rocks my foot and leg stayed the same but the rest of my body fell forward so Ouch. the front of his tibia was like a puzzle it was like piece 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 piece, oh. piece. the rest of the like the rest of the back of the tibia was fine it was just imagine if you took the front of the tibia carved out a chunk took that chunk pulled it forward an inch and broke it into like eight pieces ow ow yeah ow. it was i saw that and i was like ooh. and you know i mean did i you, didn't did, i didn't say anything did you I, hide your reaction when you saw well no that? i i know how to i saw it and, uh, you know inside i'm like hmm Okay, so he's not he's not in pain for nothing. He's not a baby. That looks like it hurts like hell. So I told the guy, he was the last, literally, I remember the story so well because he was my last patient of the day. Uh -huh. He was literally the last one I had, and the place was getting ready to close in like less than an hour. So I go over him, he's on my x-ray table, and I turn, I go around the corner after looking at the screen, I turn and point at him like, I'll be right back, don't move. I walk down the hall, I go straight to the doctor who ordered it, and I'm like, you need to come see this. He show he I get the doc, he's like, Oh yeah. Um and he's <laughs> like he leans the doc leans out the side and says, like, yeah, you you fractured your tibia bad. And so I'm doing the so then the doc looks to me as be like, Is there any chance we can just cast him right here? And I'm like, he's my last patient of the day, I've got no one else, go ahead, table's yours. So I assist him what I could, like in terms of like helping support a leg. He, the doctor brought in like two nurses had and they, they cast him right on my x ray table. Mm -hmm. You know, and the guy asked me, the Marine asked me, he's like, is this going to impact my training? Like, how, like, what's going to happen to me? And I'm like, that is not a decision I make. That is your commander's decision because they're the ones that determine how long you'll be out based on usually the doctor's discretion mm -hmm. when you can return to duty. At, so, this, at this point, considering how much you remember the story, do you have an idea about how long that guy was out for? Oh, uh, he was young. He was so young. People heal fast. Yeah. Uh, he, I would say he was probably, if I remember correctly, he was like twenty or younger. So he was a young kid. He'll heal fast. He'll probably bounce back. You know, I don't. He, they didn't need to like put a tibial rod in his leg or at all. Um, so for the most part, he looked to be. I, w I would say the usual, like you know, give it a couple months, and he'd probably be walking again. Hopefully that hopefully he is doing fine and hopefully his career is still intact and he's doing well. Mm -hmm. Or if he's not in the military, whatever he's doing, you know, yeah. hope he's doing it all right. I hope he's doing all right. Yeah, yeah that sounds like a very imp important story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, you know, honestly, there's a lot of questions I could ask you, but I'm curious. Do you have any questions that you would want to know about that maybe I could impart to you? Mm -hmm. Answer more or less. Oh, okay. Let's see. Well, okay. Uh, let's see, if I had to ask a question re military related, um, well, given the, let's, uh, let's take a current uh, concept uh, of defund the police. What is your opinion regarding the military and military budget, military spending? Should we have an active military? Should it be very strong or very well funded or should it be downsized and downgraded? You know, honestly, uh, I, I was thinking about the last time we talked and you were talking about yeah, about level of information, how much you are aware of in, in a certain conflict and things like that, and how people are quick to make judgment calls. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I kind of think that that kind of thing, particularly when it comes to this particular section, probably uh, is kind of falls in that camp. There's a lot of things I don't know about, um, and I, I would be hesitant to say that, yes, you should defund or reduce funding or support funding, because I don't have enough information about really what goes on. Mm -hmm. um, I know that the military does a pretty fantastic job of being able to move resources around, and I'm imagining the budget that they have allows them to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. I also know that we're, we have the best military pretty much in the world by estimates four times better than the next ten combined, <laughs> and that's probably due to a combination of the hard work of the people who are part of the military, it's the funding that they get and the support they get from everywhere. Um, so I'm not so sure I want to mess with that too much because um, mm -hmm. I really don't know much about it um, when it comes to that I personally think that if they're getting if they need funding that you should support them because they're the people who protect us yes you know? uh, and I also think that they do a lot of roles outside of just fighting wars and protecting us they do humanitarian efforts um, so like I think those are don't get talked about nearly enough I think a lot of people when they think of military at least 
people I've talked to jump to the conclusion that automatically they must be fighting wars. They don't even consider the fact that sometimes they build villages and help get bridges water, over bridges. Yes, do yes. All uh, sorts engineers, of engineers yeah. play a big part in like helping, you know, yeah. in, in like you know, like helping that stuff out. Yeah, engineers play a big role in the military, not in the not on the battlefield, but like in just supporting. Yeah. In general. And so, like to me, like that that's something that I. I have, you know, surface level knowledge of, but to me I think is valid. Um, I always think of people when they talk about budgets, particularly in the U.S., there's this whole space agency thing that people get like they get a small fraction of the budget. I've always thought that the space agency should have more, but I have always also thought that there, the military should have a more active role in the space agency stuff mm -hmm. that's more public because they do have a, there's a black uh, program that's you know off the books you know officially that is a military space program mm -hmm. but um, like we we don't really need to know too much about that other than when they launch satellites and things like that and that's how civilians know about the existence of it in the first place because mm -hmm. they do have to plan a flight plan and things like that um, but I think that at least in that particular way I think it should be expanded in some ways mm -hmm. um, but is this like the Trump meme, uh, the the memes of like the Space Marines for like the Trump Force, like no, like no, kind of no. like that, like like, uh, like co not conquering or colonizing no. space, but like having the United States military having an active role in like. First of all, I think the idea of a space force is actually a really good idea for mm -hmm. a variety of reasons, and not at all def necessarily fighting wars, but to defend um, against you know certain other countries' efforts to make military actions in a space that currently isn't really being manipulated too much. The idea that, you know, I guess like some countries have this this, this idea of, okay, I'm not going to have a navy because these countries I'm allies with have a navy, so I don't need a navy. I think that's kind of what's going on with space. Because no one's fighting in space, there's no need for a force. But the first country that does now becomes a dictator or it becomes a dominant it becomes force. Becomes the pow pow powerhouse, yeah. Exactly. And so, like, to me, it's like whoever, whatever country is able to develop that technology first and be able to have an actual huge force in there it's automatically going to become kind of like a, an actual literal s combat ready space station essentially i wouldn't even, i don't know if it needs to be an installation mm -hmm. but i'm just thinking the ability to deploy uh military uh assets into space and have them be able to engage in a fighting force is probably sufficient to cur to have that particular thing and here's the thing too uh, the military has had a space program of sorts, that an off-the-books kind of thing. And I think they, they even, it's like part of it might be near Edwards Air Force Base in, mm. in Southern California. Um, but they landed the, one of the space shuttles on one of those particular bases. And they've had, and technically they've had, I believe there's like a, they have a shuttle or two that are military shuttle that's not decommissioned like our shuttles are. Mm. And other sorts of you know, rocketry and things like that where they launch payloads into space. So... It's it's not entirely unheard of, <laughs> hmm. and it's been around for a lot longer than I think a lot of people really know. At least we're talking as long as we've had the shuttles, at least as long as that. Well, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. You know, if there's new regions to explore, then there's new reason, there's new areas to to defend. To defend, yeah. yeah. Um, what else? Is there any other questions? Oh, uh, let's see. Because like I'm sure the civilian perspective is probably interesting. Let's see, well, I mean, I'm technically now a civilian too, but yes, um, okay. all right, so, um, oh, let's see, I'm just gonna, this is probably a quick yes or no, most likely a no, would you ever serve? Or what circumstances would you, would it take for you to serve? World War Three. World War Three. It would have to be a World War Three scenario where an invasion force was going to affect the United States itself, where we actually stood an actual significant chance of being invaded. Mm -hmm. uh, because at that point, I'm going to be put into a conflict anyways. I'd rather be prepared than not prepared. Okay. Um, but I, as a stance, think that taking a life under any circumstances is wrong and mm -hmm. that I'm more of a diplomat when it comes to my approach. I would rather... Uh, talk it out and rather than have uh, people die over ideologies and differences of opinions Because at the end of the day, that's what most wars boil down to is that someone says that this land or this resource in some way or another is, Or my belief system is is this way and so you disagree cool. So now we're gonna fight 
and whoever whoever wins that fight is the winner of the, the argument or the person yeah, who has the, the space. Yeah, the, the, the strength of the argument is kind of irrelevant when the other side, when one side is yeah, dead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or has forced to surrender, yeah. So like that's my, that's reason, that's a reason for my particular thing. I would say I'm probably borderline pacifist, but if I'm gonna be honest with myself 100%, I'm not. I, I, I do, I, there are extremes that would, would force my hand, but I never really thought of military service as something that would be good because, well, when I was young enough for it to matter, there, there was a lot of fighting in the Middle East, and I didn't want to go there. Uh -huh. And uh, yep, uh, that's probably the, the short way of saying it. No, that's no, that's fair. Like I said, I mean, what's the phrase? War is hell. It is, and I would like to. Yeah, I don't want World War Three. You know, some people think that you know, like depending upon your political views, you, you must you must be a warmonger, and I'm like, no. I don't. I, th I think most people are generally peace loving, and they would prefer to never have to take a life. They don't want to take a life. Yeah. You know. I mean, here's the thing. I actually like. I thought about the idea of a World War Three in, in in the ways in which you know, in the past people thought about it. I mean, my dad, when I was a little kid, uh, used to tell me about like movies that used to appear, like you know, like the TV show movies mm -hmm. that appear often that were like the day. Like, uh, like the nukes we get dropped, or all sorts of things, and so horrible, like you know, ideas about what could happen. And there's like this idea that you know the Soviet Union would launch a, a first strike, and then we would respond, and then everything would be have a nuclear wasteland, and then there'd be all these wars where people would fight over resources. And it's just like that's probably not how World War Three would even happen nowadays. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably more likely to be a cyber warfare, where someone probably shuts down like the power grid. Or shuts, you know, disables some sort of uh, missable, you know, like uh, resource. Well, yeah, a lot of things are done like electronically and remotely. So, like cyber hackers and cyber terrorism. Yeah, I don't know. think I don't think that we're gonna. I mean, I'm not saying a nuclear warhead couldn't get detonated, but what I would say is it's far more likely that an attack of disabling our entire economy is probably far more damaging than any kind of bomb would be. Well, I mean, yeah. Uh, our, can't, our uh, coronavirus has done a lot of damage to our economy already. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look at that. Imagine if, hypothetically, the coronavirus, were, or what we'll call the demonetization virus, mm -hmm. um, were to you know be known as a weapon. Well, not only would that have been the most devastating weapon to have affected the world, but uh, it probably would be like almost considered an. It's it would be first of all, it's an, it would be an act of war, right? If it was from, like, let's say, hypothetically, China intentionally militarized this particular thing. And yeah, they decided, weaponized and distributed it here in America. Yeah, and decided yeah. that, like, this is, well, I, I don't think necessarily be America would have been the target. I think it would have been something else. I, oh. I, ha I have a conspiracy woo-woo land theory uh -huh. about that. Okay. But, but uh, let's say, okay, so proceed. Okay, all right. Well, I, well, we're going off the topic of the military thing, so. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll mention this a little bit, but then we'll jump back to it, okay? Okay. I just think that, like, China has had the policy of trying to control its people through military actions before. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of issues with some protesters, particularly with the whole integration of Hong Kong, mm -hmm. uh, that have happened in recent years, as, the, as we're getting closer to that particular thing, where they, get, where they basically take over Hong Kong and it becomes basically China, because in 1999 it was basically the British gave it back, mm -hmm. and then like they were supposed to, they were given like 20 years, something like that, to integrate it into China. Um, and obviously, Hong Kong is a capitalistic city. It's they're not too thrilled about it. It's but. not exactly, and so, and then they also got a thing going on with Taiwan. Oh yeah, and and whatnot, and so like it wouldn't surprise me at all to think that the lab leak hypothesis maybe it was not so much of a leak, but an encouraged subtle attack that got way out of hand. Now, if that were to be changed, let's say that's not that's, that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. Let's say that instead it was an intentional weapon that was used against its own people that got out. That still would be considered, I think, an act of war. Mm -hmm. Which is why I think a lot of people are like, and eh, we're going to cover this up. We're not going to talk about this. We're not going to let this get known too much. Because a lot of people think that the lab leak hypothesis is at least the most plausible mm -hmm. to explain what happened. So, But... That's a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah, I know. And like I said, if we don't have the, if we can't validate it with evidence, you know, at this point, it's just. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of people who are very uh, influential, people who know their things pretty well when it comes to biology, who have looked at it and have had come to that determination. Mm -hmm. That 
I think at least supports that position way more than the things that refute it. Okay. So, but all right, all right. So, do you have any other questions? Let's see. Um, hmm. At this point, I think I'm good. You know. Um, so, at this point, yeah, I'm pretty much, uh, I've got no questions for you regarding, uh, military or my military service or anything like that. Um, other than, uh, ah, the most important question of all. What's your favorite military branch? For whatever reason. I mean, I'm gonna say probably Air Force. Air Force? Oh, yeah. What's the, well, how so? Uh, it's, it's a stupid reason. It's, oh, what is it? It's a stupid reason. Uh... One of my favorite shows, like all-time TV shows, uh -huh. is uh, Stargate SG-1, uh -huh. and uh, the main branch of the military that's in there is the Air Force. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's totally oh, silly. I mean, that's nerd logic. You can't argue with it. <laughs> right, uh, it's like, uh, it's, it's fine. You know. All right, then. Uh, cool. All and right. least favorite branch? <sighs> Don't they say Is it Army? Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> well, all right. I'm gonna explain why. Okay. okay. I think I think it's it's probably just because I don't know enough about it. Uh -huh. It's not because I think the army is necessarily bad. It's it's an entire part of like of our society that I think is f a lot of assumptions are made mm -hmm. about the armed service, and I think that not a lot of people really take the time to fully understand really what's going on there, mm -hmm. and so. I am not an exception to this. <laughs> like, I'm definitely, I don't know enough, and that's okay. Maybe I'll get the opportunity to learn more. Um, but for me, from what I gather, it seems to be the part of the military that is, actually, you know what? I'm going to take that back. It's not the Army. Ah, what is it? It's the National Guard. The National Guard. <laughs> Technically part of the military. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Technically part of the military, but it is a yes, subcategory. Yeah. yeah, the National Guard and the Reserves are technically part of the Army, yeah. but yes, yeah. they're if, a subcategory. If, 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 we're, if we're talking about main category, yes, it's Army. If we're talking about subcategory, then it's the National Guard. Okay. And the only reason why I do that is because, to me, the National Guard and the, the Reserves are... I feel like if you're going to defend the country you need to do it all you made a commitment all the way be more active about it yeah and and like protecting the homeland like it is like a good concept and so like on the surface the national guards that but i know a little bit about the national guard uh -huh. <laughs> and i know there's a little bit more to it than just that and i think that like uh to me it's just not the same kind of service that i I personally would think makes sense considering the roles fun fun story in boot camp okay, okay. so in boot camp uh, we had people, uh, we were getting close to the end of cycle, we were towards the end of blue phase. Now this is when, like, people, we were starting to get more chill and relaxed, like, you have red, white, and blue phase, literally red, white, and blue. <laughs> sure. Each one is essentially, like, you know, the first third, the second third, and the final third of your boot camp, your basic. And so, uh, in the blue phase, we're getting close to, like, figuring out, like, you know, people, people are pretty much graduating, and we know who's not going to graduate. Like, there's a, there's, like, always... A couple, a small handful of people that just aren't going to cut it. So we know they're not graduating, and they're already like on the way of phasing out. So then, we're going. We're all th going through. A, we're all standing out in a breezeway, and we have the entire company there, and all four um, platoons. You know, all four platoons are in there, and the drill sergeants are going through. Um, you know, like this is who you are. You know. This is your rank. This is where you're going, and you know, and they're and they're confirming if they're accurate, if the information they have is up to date, so they don't send you to the, your next location with the wrong information. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna make sure that everything's up to date. So they make sure be like, okay, are you active? Are you reserve? Or are you national guard? And so during the most people were saying active, but every now and then you would hear someone say national guard. And then you would, and someone would be like, and people would be like smiling or laughing at them. And then the, occasionally you heard the phrase, someone would mumble the phrase weekend warrior. <laughs> you would hear something like that. Like people would kind of give the National Guard and the Reserves a little shit for it. Be like, come on, come on, you know, suck it up and go full time. You know, be, be active because active is essentially full time. Whereas National Guard and Reserves... You know, it's like part-time military, sure. and you know, you're you're pretty much home state side, and you're doing your normal thing in addition to the military. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like you know I mean, and it's it's all it's just a little ribbing and side jabbing. It's not like there's actual anger or animosity towards the towards them. You know, it's just 
It's people doing what they've always done and giving each other shit. It's <laughs> what we do. Just some good old love. You know, it's a, yeah, some okay. good old, some good old, you know, giving you a hard time. Okay. That's, you know, so that was a little, you know, I think that's a good, st fun story to end it on. Yeah, perhaps, but there's one thing oh. I'll, I'll ask. Okay. So if I went to the military, mm -hmm. do you think I would have washed out? Hmm, it depends on, I don't think, physically, I don't, I think you would have been fine. It's the mentality of it. I don't know. The big, that's the hardest part, in my opinion, is being able to surrender your freedom in terms of someone's telling you this is, you're, you don't choose where you go, what you do, what, and you don't choose that. Someone else is choosing that for you. And a lot of people don't have what it takes to essentially take orders and follow them obediently. Like, I just don't see that. A lot of people are very rebellious. I know people, I, a lot of people that I hang out with currently and like do Magic the Gathering, physically they could probably hack it, you know, when given enough time. It's the mental, it's the mental aspect that they just, some people just don't have what it takes to shelve their own, their sense of independence mm -hmm. and their individuality and their pride to be able to shut up, take any verbal lashing you get, you know, take whatever verbal abuse you get in boot camp mm -hmm. and then just deal with it. You know, I joined at the age of 27. I knew, I understood what boot camp was. I understood how to get past it, and I understood they're going to try and get you to want to quit. You know, they're going to play the mental game with you. Sure. So I knew better than to fall. fall to that. I knew better, you know, physically was the hardest part for me. Mentally, I'm just like, this is easy. I expected them to verbally abuse me way worse. I was expecting worse. Mm. Well, not, not full metal jacket worse, but like, we're, I was expecting more... Then the occasional shut the fuck up. I was expecting more than that, you know. I mean, but you know, physically it was the hardest part for me because like I was having some like tendon or like yeah, some I had some pain going on in my knees and I didn't quite understand it what was going on. I think like during like it was during a jog, whatever. I like sprained like uh, some like tendons and lig or ligaments in my knees, but eventually I found out that I needed to essentially take my helmet, my combat helmet. You know, really hard, and I eventually massaged my knee, mm -hmm. and I massaged the muscles and the, the the ligaments and tendons right on the sides of my knee, and it hurt like hell. But it eventually, I was like, oh, that that's really doing it. So like, the worst are the worst aspect of boot camp for me was the physical aspect because mm -hmm. I was actually going through some legit pain, and I was like, this isn't the type of pain where you're just sore. This is pain, pain. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, but the mental aspect, I think, is probably what most people would struggle with. So, and I don't know if you're, are you the type of person to silently, to shut up and obey orders and only speak out, like, when something, you know, either immoral, illegal, or unethical has been ordered? Are you the, are you the type to, you've been ordered to do something stupid, would you do it immediately? You don't understand it. It's not like you would, you're like, this is stupid or pointless. Like you, like, you know, like, hey, those rocks over there, go pick them all up and move them over here right now. Like, would you, would you do that? I think it depends on the circumstance. Yeah, then. I think like if I was in the military, mm -hmm. okay, and I, a person of authority told me to go do something that was not, as you just said, you know, essentially, you know, correct. You know, something that was morally yeah. Okay, that it, but it was like something that was it was dull, mundane, or stupid. Would I question the particular thing and stop it? There's a part of me that would love to be like, yeah, absolutely. But the truth is, is that if I'm told by an authoritarian figure, do this, typically I usually do. I, I had, when I was a child, mm -hmm. uh, when I was younger, um, I had to go through a pretty intense uh, experience that um, changed a little bit about who I was. Mm -hmm. who I am and uh, it shaped how, how I look at things and uh, I think that through that particular process I learned to follow um, to some extent orders and, and uh, things so that way uh, even if I didn't understand why I just did, I did went along with it because I understood that it was for the better good mm -hmm. and in that situation I think that, that I, I could do it but I think that uh, it would be an adjustment it would be something I'd have to you know, acclimate to, take like a day or two. Mm -hmm. I'd yeah. definitely be the guy who, who says something stupid in the day one and has to do a whole bunch of like push-ups. That would be me. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, we, we had a few fair share of those guys too. Yeah. Um, you know, 
people who spoke out of turn, shit like that. It was fun. It was, it was a good time. A lot of people did not like, uh, what's it called? Uh, there was also, God, what was that one called? Uh, God, I can't remember. There was a, there was a time period just before boot camp that where you're sent there and it's like, it's like you're pre boot camp, but you're still like under the rules. You're given your little blue book. You're being issued your army uniforms. You're being issued everything. You're being measured, sized up. I forget what that's called. Oh God, um, it was prob that was really rough processing. <laughs> Not even that. I mean, Meps is the military pro. That Meps is the processing part where they're like issue. Like you already know what you're gonna do by the time you get there. It's Meps. They ship you, fly you out. You get to the base, and then before boot camp, there's like a week long procedure where you're like for a week you're living in like these other barracks that are not your normal barracks you're given you're being given you you're being given food your books you're having your photo taken for your ID card but for the love of me I can't remember what it is but it was probably one of the more frustrating aspects of army because people said like because you on average got only four hours of sleep that sounds like Lovely. That's my. That's my. Uh, that's for you. That's good. But for us normal human beings, uh, hey, that's, whoa, that whoa, was whoa. normal. I I am a normal human being. Okay. Oh, <laughs> uh, we hated it. Um, it was funny because then we at at the end of boot camp they took a they did a little poll, a little survey. Mm. What would you rather go back through? Would you go through that one week or all and uh, boot camp or like you know which is three months? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people like I'd I'd go through boot camp, and I'm like. I'll go through the one week. And they're like, why? It was hell. And I'm like, yeah, but it's only a week. It's over faster. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking long term. Y'all are thinking short term. <laughs> I'm like, like y'all can go through boot camp a second time if you want. I'll go through a week of that stuff because there was no training. It was just lack of sleep that sucked the most. I mean, that's like that's not even a problem for me. <laughs> like, you know. I, I would, I would, that would be like a, a normal day. <laughs> yeah, it was just like four to five hours of sleep. Wake up, no, stand so, so out in the get freezing. Five hours of sleep. That's so it's like possibly. It's like it's if one, you're lucky, it's one more than I need. <laughs> you know, yeah, that was the, that was. I can't, yeah, I can't remember. It's it's gonna bother me for a while, but yeah, just before boot camp, you're being given all. You're given your dog tags. You're given your ID card. You're given your uniforms. Your little blue book, which has like basic rules and regulations in them. Mm -hmm. You know, stuff like that you're taught the army song. You're taught like a bunch of rudimentary stuff before you get to boot camp okay. you know okay so, so I guess this is where I'm gonna end it I'm gonna end it like this after hearing all that stuff about the military could you hack it in the military do you think that you guys could join it I'd like to see that in the comments section I'd like to see this in the emails and I'll see you guys all in the next one have a good night everybody